We all love feeling smart, or sapient, as I like to call it, but what if I told you that there are people out there who get off of that very feeling as a living, who just talk and talk and talk for hours on end like a bunch of assholes and make money off of it? I'm obviously talking about video essay channels, the backbone of society. Video essays are really big on YouTube at the moment, and have been for a while. At this point, for whatever topic or niche you might be interested in, there's probably some guy on the internet that has made a way too long video about it. You want to see a video the length of three feature films on Nikocado Avocado? Well, the right opinion has got you covered. Do you want to see a two and a half hour long video on the Vampire Diaries? Well, uh, Jenny Nicholson made the video right for you. Do you want to see a, a really good and intelligent and a good award-winning uh, analysis on the Mr. Beastification of YouTube? Uh, it's a genre on YouTube that I personally adore, and because of how wide the range of what a video essay can really be, it's been really fun to see the various ways that people manage to insert their own personality in whatever analysis they really want to make. These people spending sometimes months and months on end working on and researching the most obscure but interesting topics out there, it's super fun and interesting, and, and I'm not really alone in my enjoyment of this. Since these videos cover a pretty wide range of topics, their viral potential is absolutely huge, with videos sometimes getting millions and millions of views, so uh, that hard work can really pay off sometimes. But alongside the success of the more uh, higher quality video essay channels, we've also seen something else, and that is the rise of the mass-produced almost fast food chain like video essay channels with a twinge of corporate feeling. Channels who've realized how easy it can really be to capitalize off of the success of this genre and uh, fully went for it, posting videos left and right like it's nobody's business. And the problem here is not just with the quantity of these videos, there's actually uh, some pretty decent video essay channels that post regularly but do uh, more short videos that are very good. The channels that I'm talking about make their videos in a factory essentially. Sometimes they're even run by corporations. They make the video like on an assembly line. They'll have one guy uh, coming up with a like, ideas and topics, have another person read out that script, and then another person to edit the whole thing in a, like, sleek and uh, even maybe too smooth of a way. And then someone to make a thumbnail with the most horrible and uh, repulsive piece of art you've ever seen in your entire life. And in a lot of these cases, there's probably not a lot happening here that is I guess morally wrong per se, it is just depressing, but I think it's fascinating to look into the eyes of this, this beast, this machine. Does creating video essays in that way where you need to come up with uh, groundbreaking, attention-grabbing takes on an almost daily basis uh, cause some sort of problem? Or am I just a dumb little whiny baby? In today's five hour long video essay, we're gonna figure out exactly- <laughs> This video is brought to you by my Patreon. If you want to support what I do over here, my Patreon link is in the description. Uh, you'll get an extra video off of it a month, and a Discord. I have a Discord where I talk to people. It's just a nice way to, you know, support what's going on here if you feel inclined to do so. So yeah. How about you check that out, huh? <laughs> Part of the reason as to why this genre is as big as it is, is because of how broad the definition of what a video essay is can really be. There aren't any physical requirements for you to be able to call yourself a video essayist. You don't need a college degree, you don't need a, to have like a job in the field that, that you're talking about in advance. You can just be some sort of like idiot. You know, some kind of dumbass. A video essayist can just be some person with a take, and potentially a good and profound one. Video essays can be long, they can be short, they can be about media, politics, a pickle Rick is a video essay, essentially any video that talks about like a subject with a script made in advance. Well, after doing a lot of thinking, I came to the realization that a lot of what uh, defines these videos besides all being, you know, a piece of content that talks about and analyzes a thing, 
Uh, the main component that really ties them all together is one of aesthetics. A vibe. A certain type of uh, title and thumbnail that help indicate to you, the viewer, that you're about to watch some, you know, some smart shit. And there's a lot of ways to achieve this effect. Maybe use some slick editing, maybe use some fancy words like uh, sapien. And you know, just generally talking in a way that makes people believe that you're smarter. Or a uh, sapien -er. And, you know, using these elements doesn't necessarily mean that the video that you're gonna make is bad. It's actually just like a common sort of bunch of common attributes to video essays. Since the qualifications for doing this job are essentially non-existent, a lot of these mass-produced video essay channels will essentially use these aesthetic elements as a way to make you think that what they're saying is a lot more profound than what it actually is. Uh, let's talk about Sunny V2. A lot of people have already talked about his Mr. Beast Chris video and how insanely dumb it really is. The Chris Tyson situation could become a complete disaster for Mr. Beast brand. However, it may also provide some unique benefits. The video is incredibly invasive and weird. Chris, who works with or for the Mr. Beast channel, has decided to come out as trans. Uh, something that's well within his right to do. As life decisions go, this isn't really something that's uh, any of Sunny V2's concern, uh, but the way that the video decides to focus on things is incredibly weird. So let's begin by going over the drama before explaining exactly how this will impact the Mr. Beast channel. Looking at this whole thing of like, uh, just Chris being open about who he is, as a Mr. Beast related business decision is a uh, freak shit. It's some freak shit, honestly. He tries to like, at some point analyze Chris's marriage. He is quite literally talking about Chris's life as if he's a character in a TV show. And if we've learned anything from Hollywood in recent years, it's that adding over the top LGBT characters for the sake of relatability rarely works as intended and is often nothing more than a distraction from the premise of the movie or video. What makes this video so ghoulish to me is the fact that he essentially ignores the fact that Mr. Beast and Chris are uh, human beings. Human beings that make decisions and choices that have nothing to do with, like, any form of content whatsoever. What Mr. Beast is deciding to do here is what he's done in his entire life. It's an inactive decision. He's just staying friends with someone who he's always been friends with. I remember when Mr. Beast was doing this interview and he was talking about how he intentionally chooses to show less uh, personality in his videos because A, it makes it so he can just relate to a broader audience, but also because uh, it makes him kind of stay away from drama and people attacking him. That is uh, a lot of pressure. Hmm. Because yeah. the, the product of the video is your personality. Well, yeah, because yeah. if you're depressed or you're yeah. going through stuff, you know, it's harder to make videos. And at the time, I definitely understood his point and thought that it makes sense. Uh, but this really, really, really just, I don't know, uh, proves his point fully. <laughs> Even this, this inactive choice of his, this decision to stay friends with someone, is being picked apart here and analyzed as a business decision. It's something for some Australian video essay guy to pick apart and analyze. It's something that's looked at as uh, content. Even when not talking about issues that are as sensitive, Sunny V2 has been having some dumbass takes for a while now. I've been, I, I don't know if hate watching is the right word, but like annoyingly watching or begrudgingly watching his videos for some time now and time and time again i've been absolutely shocked by the sort of things that he can get away with because of his sort of uh posh adjacent australian accent uh, where he sounds a bit like a news reporter a few months after dream's face reveal sunny v2 posted this video called why Dream's face reveal was an awful decision. Dream's face reveal could qualify as the worst mistake made by a content creator ever. 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 
ever. Ever. This video is weird as hell, I'll, I'll tell you that much. In Dream's face reveal video, he talks about how part of the reason as to why he decided to show his face after all this time uh, is because of the looming threat of various uh, doxings and, you know, any sort of uh, information leak whatsoever. The obsessive attempts of fans and other people alike to try and figure out how this guy's face looks like uh, was starting to cross the line. The people trying to leak my face, trying to find out what I look like, trying to... There's too, there's too many. It's a, a little, a little, just a, a tiny, tiny bit too much. And you know, I, I don't want to come off in this video as some sort of a big dream defender. Uh, uh, I'm not, but I'm mainly looking at what he says here at the context of Sonny's video, and what he says makes a lot of sense, right? It makes sense to uh, not want to be doxxed. That doesn't seem like a lot of fun. This is an actual real threat to him and his loved ones, something real to worry about. There are more than enough cases of fans swarming private houses of people or even like haters and stuff. And worse, SWAT teams coming to people's houses, breaking them down, terrifying and traumatizing the people that live inside of them. It makes sense that he wouldn't like to deal with that. Obviously. But, but Sunny V2 doesn't really like this very much. Yet perhaps he was simply unaware of just how relevant these incidents were keeping him. Additionally, since almost all growth on YouTube comes from some kind of uncomfortability, Dream should have recognized this feeling as a signpost to let these attempted exposés continue, giving him wave after wave of free relevancy. What? He should have let go of the feeling of... What, being uncomfortable with his life being leaked out like that? With his private residence being known to the public? He should have just been like, what, like fine with that being a thing? The potential of having a home invasion or getting swatted for, for what? For clout? Because these attempts at his invasion of privacy uh, can be like reported on and go viral? That, that that seems like a good excuse for that. Are you are you crazy? Sunny V2 is showing on screen Dream's actual doxing information that random people have leaked online. I decided to blur it, but I mean this is again an actual real threat. Something uh, for you to really worry about. It's not that Sonny is giving a counter argument to what Dream is saying. He's not saying that, you know, um, maybe face revealing won't change the doxing situation all that much. Maybe it'll make it even worse. That's an actual fair argument that you might bring up and saying why face revealing is a bad idea. And that would be fair enough. But that's not what he's doing. He accepts Dream's concerns. He agrees that they're a real thing, uh, but he tells him to ignore them because making money is more important than that. In the world of Sunny V2's videos, no decision can be made uh, to just better your own personal life. Everything has to be done with the context of content as a calculated move to feed the algorithm, which explain uh, why his videos feel like they were made by a cold-hearted robot. Throughout the entire video, Sonny talks in a really authoritative tone. I mean, the video in itself is called Why Dream's Face Reveal Was an Awful Decision. He presents it as if the decision has already proven itself as being bad, but it's important to state that uh, this was posted like in between when Dream face revealed and when Dream released his next video. At the time of Sunny releasing that video, he actually didn't really know if Dream's face reveal was a bad idea or not. He just knew that the idea of saying that would uh, drive clicks to his video. Yes, his next upload did actually get a lot less views than he usually does, but that could just be attributed to the fact that Dream has just quit the one series that was really successful for him. In general, if you really want to look at the lesson here from Dream's decline in views, it's uh, don't just have one idea, you know? <laughs> don't just do one idea for like, you should probably have like at least two or three more ideas. Even way before the face reveal, every time Dream tried to like kind of stray away from uh, making those Hunter versus Speedrunner videos, 
it would get way less views, even in like a normal Minecraft video. It makes a lot of sense that a video that's just a, a like a vlog of Dream and a bunch of people and Mr. Beast going through Antarctica, uh, it makes sense that it won't do as well. His Minecraft audience is just not as interested in that. Not to mention that Minecraft videos have been getting a lot less views this year because, you know, Lockdown's over, kids are back in school. But that sort of normal explanation is not enough for Sunny V2. He needs to create some sort of weird lesson here, some sort of cautionary tale. Don't face reveal or uh, you'll be less rich, I guess. Don't make decisions to better your personal life if you're gonna make less money off of it. It often feels like with Sunny V2's videos, the main actual thing that's being thought of here is just the title and thumbnail, and then you click on the video and it's a mess. You know, a neat and organized one, but still a mess at that. I feel like if you take away this sort of like, you know, the way that he talks with that accent of his, and the, the sleek editing that looks like a like you're watching an Apple commercial and those thumbnails, those 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 god awful thumbnails, so freakish and made out of plastic. I know it's bad to make fun of like a person's art, but these look like NFTs. This this looks like pure ass. Because <laughs> I guess it's essentially traced over the original pictures, but like it looks in the sort of pop art. Pop, is pop art a, the word that I'm? I'm thinking of here. It looks like ass. That's all I'm I'm trying to say really. <laughs> all of this is here to sell you the the allure, the idea that something substantial and meaningful is about to be said here. That's why uh, with every Sunny V2 upload, you'll get like a billion people reacting to that thing. Mouth open as this guy says one of the dumbest takes I've ever heard of my entire life. <laughs> the video in itself is nothing but an afterthought, something to justify the title and thumbnail that he picked. In reality, after you click on one of these videos, the guy could essentially still say whatever he wants and get the same amount of views because the aesthetic does such a good job of selling you the whole thing. The need to feed this beast called the algorithm doesn't just end in a few bad takes. Sometimes uh, you may run out of ideas to talk about because you upload so much. And when that happens, you may need to resort to a little thing that I like to call stealing. A few months ago, a YouTuber called The Asher Show made a video about a channel called Anna Oop, a video essay slash a tea channel slash content farm channel posting videos every single day. Anna Oop's channel is absolutely huge with over 2 million subscribers and uh, most of their content is like uh, drama related stuff. Zendaya called out for forcing her stylist to quit. Uh, Charlie D'Amelio cheats on Landon with mystery guy. Nessa Barrett, Barre, like the hat, accused of dating Olivia Rodrigo's of sirens. I'm in New York right now and there's just noise everywhere. There's like sirens going off. There's helicopters going off. This uh, place is like a war zone uh, intended to make me to make me regret filming my video on a rooftop. It's a bunch of videos uh, that have clearly not been made for me. And that's okay. It's okay for a channel to make videos that I'm not supposed to watch. Uh, but every now and again, uh, yeah, Anna Oop likes to dabble in a little bit of Anna... Anna... <laughs> I was trying to think of a pun. She dabbles in stealing. Like Asher says in his video, it makes sense for multiple people to come up with a video on the same topic. I'm sure that's something that I've done in the past as well. We all get the same news cycle. We see the same trending topics on Twitter and we decide to make videos based on those topics. Sometimes you might scroll on your homepage on YouTube and see a video idea that you want to do yourself. But you come up with your own title, you come up with your own video idea and you add something different different and most importantly you credit the person that you may have taken it from but you shouldn't just fully like rip off a guy <laughs> that's kind of rude <laughs> if you end up finding yourself taking inspiration from someone which is you know absolutely fine by the way 
Uh, the least you can do is maybe, I don't know, credit the guy, do something like that. I, I feel like that should be kind of like common courtesy with YouTubers. Which, you know what, in Sunny V2's defense, that is something that he's done in the past. And Anna has at times as well, but mostly hasn't. Her level of ripping someone off uh, should be studied in, in, in universities. Uh, she'll essentially like fully rip off some talking points for people like word to word and then also like not leave it at that she'll steal the thumbnail as well this is my thumbnail you can obviously see where anna oop got the idea for the thumbnail from it's definitely mine if you watch the video the content is almost it's like i did all of the research for her video when she just reskinned it for her channel and you know uh, the goal of doing that is kind of crazy, you know? Throughout Asher's video, you can see time and time again Anna Oop doing that sort of thing, stealing the video, the title, and the thumbnail, and then also just profiting off of it like crazy because the channel is huge. And she, or the company that's behind this channel, uh, know that they can get away with that sort of thing. And there's something about that that's incredibly frustrating. April 20th, 2021, I made a video called Meet the Biggest Copycat on TikTok. It was about this TikToker, New Main, who would steal other people's videos. Sound familiar? Nine months later, the most disgusting guy on TikTok, Anna Oop. Original copy, the guy's in the middle. Original copy, the guy's in the middle. People are praising Anna Oop in the comments. I love your videos. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Anna, for this vid. As a content creator, what are you really supposed to do? here you're going up against a massive company a content farm a factory when what a channel does is just push out content again and again and again to feed this sort of machine no matter what who gives a shit about what they're stealing from they're just gonna do it because they need to keep going asher is probably just one example out of many that yeah, have experienced a very similar thing if not by anna oop then by another one of these sort of uh content farmy sort of channel <laughs> standing in front of this machine this beast can make you feel helpless tiny and if you can't really beat them why not join them jake tran and illuminati illuminati yeah i think that's how i'm supposed to say it are two youtubers that seemingly content farmed content farmified their channel uh each one posting a billion video essays a week illuminati is now posting i think a video essay every single day it's kind of crazy i didn't used to watch illuminati so i'm not gonna focus on that channel but with jake tran specifically i remember a bunch of his videos showing up in my feed and uh they were pretty cool he a lot of times had some pretty meaningful stuff to say a lot of videos had some pretty you know interesting uh lessons about like really bad businesses he was talking about a bunch of things that should be called out the lengths that evil businesses could go uh just to just to make a quick buck and then he became rich. His team became absolutely massive. He got like a voice actor to do some stuff for him for his videos. And then like the subjects of his own videos, he essentially just started doing the very same things that he was like talking about. He made a video about how like the lottery is bad and scamming you. And then he promoted a uh, a gambling thing, <laughs> making like anti NFT videos and then promoting NFT projects in those very same videos. I showed how he had started selling NFTs in videos about how bad NFTs are or selling crypto in a video about how crypto is. And it was just so weird to watch. And it's obvious why he took those deals. Um, lots of money, lots of money is on the table over here. Uh, more money than any sort of sponsor could give you whatsoever. These goddamn crypto uh, projects just throw out cash willy-nilly, probably offering him like hundreds of thousands of dollars, an amount of money that I guess is hard to say no to even if you're a millionaire. But even with that being the case, you know, you'd think that he'd have some shame about it. Uh, but his response to all of that was uh, worse. Well, what did you expect out of a channel that teaches you to be evil? I do really appreciate the honesty of this, but on the other much more important hand, uh, 
you're kind of admitting that you don't care if your audience gets scammed by you, which it seems really wrong. He then added that every sponsor on this channel helps fund this channel so we can help upping the quality and quantity. You're not going to be the right fit for every sponsor on this channel, and that's okay. So if you don't like the sponsors, skip the ads, don't buy for them, or unsubscribe from the channel. Uh, which is a really funny answer. <laughs> I did it because I wanted more money. <laughs> Jake Tran also sells like an online course now that teaches you how to like uh, get a bunch of money from a laptop job. Um, I don't know what qualifies him to really do that. How to systematically find out what remote job is best for you. People don't live happy lives by mistake. Success is systematic, planned, and carefully executed. Yeah, I mean, every person that tries to sell you the idea that success is systematic should probably kind of <laughs> watch out from them. How to crush any interview. I bombed all my interviews, it was awful, but the great news for you, I mean, again, you know, remember when I told you that video essayists don't really need um, any sort of qualifications to do what they do. I guess you don't really need any qualifications to start one of these bullshit ass courses. Um, it, this costs $97. He's just posting a random ass picture over here with uh, of him and Graham Stephan. What's going on? The video how Quebble Cop lost his entire audience in one year by Sunny V2 is uh, ass. It's just ass. It's a rambling mess. The video is about 15 minutes long. The first third of it is spent just speculating whether his uh, relationship with Aziland ending is the reason for his decline. In order to answer that question, let's begin by looking at a Twitter post made by Quebblecop in early 2020. Before things go any further, I want to address the rumors. After three and a half years of being together, Azzy and I recently broke up. He talks about their breakup and their relationship for a while, only to reveal at the end of it all uh, that it's all baseless. There is no correlation between this breakup and Quebble Cup losing viewers. Sure, he had one less person to collaborate and make videos with. However, if we take the date of Geordie's separation announcement, March 2020, and place it alongside his view count at the time, he actually went up in views after breaking up with Azzyland. So why is he bringing it up? It's just weird. Sunny brings a lot more potential reasons to Quebble Cop's decline. Some of them uh, make more sense than others. Uh, him separating from his group channel, having a beef with uh, some guy. Uh, a lot of really interesting stuff, I'll, t I'll tell you that much. But then Sunny reaches to his ultimate point, the one that's presented in his ugly, ugly thumbnail for all its glory. His thesis is that Quebble Cop lost his audience because he bragged about being rich. Welcome to my seven and a half million dollar penthouse tour. Let's see if this video can hit 100,000 likes. And it's just like, why would you post this dude? You think it's just a coincidence that David Dobrik got canceled in the same month that he posted his brand new multi-million dollar house to YouTube? When you invite envy into the life of others, you pay for it in ways which you will not expect. Little Joel, who's kind of like Big Joel, but smaller, uh, made a pretty good point about it in a video. The data does not prove out this point, really. You know, there's a trend in Quebble Cop's views. They've been declining for a pretty long time. And it's not like the month that he released these three videos changed everything for him, you know, ruined his career. It's kind of just been a slow decline. One, Quebble Cop is doing worse than he used to. Two, he did a thing that Sunny V2 and that I don't like. He bragged about his wealth. What you can do with that is just kind of make a connection. What if the reason why Quebble Cop's not doing that well is the fact that he's doing something that I don't like? You don't really need evidence to support that conclusion. It's sort of evidence is itself. The reality of the situation is lots of things happen in the world. YouTubers are not successful forever. They do better, they do worse. To generate some causal relationship between their being problematic in some way and them not doing well, what it serves to do is, is kind of give us the fantasy of control, right? It gives us the sort of moralistic fantasy that negative actions are getting punished and people get their due. It speaks, I think, to a desire to make the universe make sense. And I think that's a really interesting point. It's why I decided to leave it in this video, mainly in full, to kind of speak for itself. 
But I also think that Big Joel is kind of missing something here. I don't think that Sonny V2 says what he says at the end of that video in this sort of attempt to figure out the universe. I don't believe that Sunny V2 really cares about that, at least in the context of his videos. I, I don't know him in real life. This all comes down to what we talked about at the beginning, that Sonny's videos are mainly an afterthought to his title and thumbnail. That's why he gives about like five or six different possible reasons as to why Quebblecop uh, lost his viewership. And the one that makes the least sense, the one that is the most odd and out of place, is also the one that he put in his thumbnail. He created this narrative of a man uh, losing everything because he boasted about his wealth because it's interesting, because it's good content. And I think that that's the actual dangerous thing here. Twisting human life so it fits the narrative of something like a TV show. It's essentially what he did with Chris, Mr. Beast, or Dream. He puts everything into a clear narrative for us to follow, a distinct black and white sort of situation, a good deed and a bad deed. And I feel like when you alter and twist reality in that way, you end up losing a lot of very important things, things that I really appreciate in a lot of these sort of videos you end up losing empathy. In general, one of the main things that I really hate about these sort of video essays and the people who rip off Sunny V2 as well, is that, honestly, it's just a lot less fun to watch. It feels like no one is having fun making these videos. It feels like a slob of content that's made for you to eat up, uh, consume, and and forget about. It has a lot of the similar problems that I brought up in the Mr. Beastification video. There are now so many channels who rip off what Sunny V2 is doing, who copy him to a T, have similarly lazy points to make. And the reason as to why they're doing that is because it works. Sunny V2, with the views that he's getting, makes uh, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. A lot is being thrown out the window here for the sake of sleekness, and I think that's kind of lame, you know? These little tidbits of personality are what I enjoy about these videos, you know, besides the points that these people are making. I cried uh, when I watched the latest Defunctland video about the Disney Channel theme intro. Who would have thought that that could happen to me from a Disney Channel theme intro? I cried because the video was incredible. It's a video that's gonna stay in my mind for a while, that's gonna inspire me uh, in my own creations. Even stuff like Jenny Nicholson wearing goofy ass outfits in her videos. I think that's a lot of fun. Jake Tran could never do what Big Joel does. He could never film a video in a in a hot tub. He could never have creepy little angles in his videos. He could never do that, you know, because because he's a coward. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot to appreciate with channels that you know, kind of decide to stick to their guns, who decide to stay true to who they are, uh, when the alternative is so much more lucrative. Uh, especially Big Joel. I like his videos. You should, you should check Big Joel out. He's my favorite YouTuber at the moment. I wonder how I'd feel if my life was whittled down to a Sunny V2 cautionary tale. Uh, what would the title be? Dumb f idiot loser decides to uh, spend a month on his video instead of getting that fuck bag like a like a f idiot. <laughs> this dumb little whiny baby is whining about creativity in another one of his videos instead of getting his bag like a real man. Shut up, dumb little baby. No one wants to see you whining again. Would that be the title? The last video I posted on this channel uh, was a one hour long video about Pickle Rick, and it's unironically my magnum opus. I'm not really embarrassed to say it. It took me a while to make it. it has a musical number in it that I wrote. I hired out a stage uh, to like film it on. Part of the reason as to why I made it was to see if I could make something like that. I wanted to use the video and the length of it as an excuse to, you know, just kind of like have fun. And when I finished that video, after all the work that I put in, I made something that I was really proud of. 
I, I, I felt happy with it. I really, really was. And then I posted the video and all of that work was reduced to a bunch of numbers. Uh, the watch time, the click-through rate, uh, the views, the money that the video made. That's kind of what you're left with for a while. The video did fine. It actually got a lot less views than a, a, a drama-related video that I recorded and edited in a day. It had me thinking, is all this, like, creative bullshit really worth it? And I think that's something that a lot of creators think about at some point. I'm sure that's something that Jake Tran thought about before he made that sort of transition in his channel. Why should I be busting my ass working for hours on end and uh, make a lot less money than what I can potentially make? As much as I don't like the way that Sunny V2 talks about stuff, there is something relatable to that. Something in that voice exists in my head as well. This idea of, you know, what's stopping me? The whole thing got me thinking that maybe... Maybe it's time for me to sell out a little bit.